The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is October, Tuesday, October 4th. I am Michael Brooks, and today's a special pre-recorded edition of The Majority Report. We still recorded it at steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Sam's conversation with Jay Rosen, media scholar and critic on how the whole media infrastructure of this country just can't withstand Donald Trump. Fascinating interview. No live show today, but a brand new one for members and non-members alike. Tonight, we're going to be doing live coverage of the vice presidential debate. Go to majority.fm to find out exactly what time to to uh, stream us on YouTube or on our website. See you tonight. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program. He is the uh, author of PressThink.org. Is a professor of journalism at NYU, and you can find him on Twitter at at J Rosen NYU. Uh, professor Rosen, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Sam. So um, I, I'm I'm very uh, excited to talk to you about this because uh, uh, obviously I, uh, to a certain extent, I mean I think it, I am in this uh, this world of political coverage. I, I probably am. I think it's probably more accurate to say, and I have noticed that and felt that the system has been overwhelmed um, mm-hmm. in a different way, <clears throat> or I should say, I mean, I have felt uh, through the, the, the uh, decade or two that I've been involved in this type of work that the system doesn't function particularly well. Uh, but this is of a different kind. It's that it's, that it's overwhelmed. And you've uh, written a piece entitled A Symmetry Between the Major Parties Fries the Circuits of the Mainstream Press. Uh, and you, you outline five, uh, uh, I guess, principles or six principles um, that are, uh, are, are guiding your ability to assess what's going on. Is that, is, mm-hmm. that, is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's what I'm doing there. All right. Well, let's go through those so that uh, mm-hmm. we can all join you on this journey. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is uh, just give us uh, basically your report card up to this point of of how the press is doing or and maybe it even makes more sense to start with. What should the political press do in a uh, democracy or, uh, you know, uh, a a political system like ours? Well, I I would start with um, the recognition that. When people want to take down a free society, when they want to close down a democracy, when they want to send a country, let's say, like Turkey or uh, or Venezuela, back from the brink of democracy to something darker, one of the first things they do is they attack the press. They attack the means by which people know what's going on. And so... To answer your question, what what the press should do in a, in a democracy is illuminate the stakes of an election, allow people to cast an intelligent vote, um, show who the candidates are and and what they're about. And also, I think journalists stand for and make possible a certain kind of politics in which – we aren't ruled by emotion and hate and tribalism and uh, violence uh, and threat, but instead by uh, deliberation and rational calculation of self-interest and um, an understanding of our world. And what is so extraordinary about this campaign is that you had a candidate, Donald Trump, who's not only an unexpected victor of the nomination fight, but he's a threat to these basic values that create the need for journalism in the first place. And he represents a um, a uniquely difficult um, – he represents a uniquely difficult uh, challenge to that 
agenda of informing the press just as to who he is in some yeah. respects. Uniquely difficult challenge in many different ways. Um, and we can talk about some of them. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones I point out in my piece that I think is really hard to deal with is that I think he wants to generate confusion about where he stands and what his ideas and uh, principles are. And when you have a candidate who's trying to make things as confused as possible so that people just throw up their hands and vote in emotion or tribalism, there's not a lot in the rule book for how to deal with that. But there's many other ways in which he's a completely unique, unexpected candidate and a, and a threat to the democratic system. I, 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 we, uh, we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I, I think that was mm-hmm. number, uh, what was that, number four, uh, or in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the, the clarity as to what his positions are. Um, mm-hmm. And... Um, but let's let's stay on that one, and then we'll double back because I mean, there's there's uh, you describe that what is tradi- traditional is that um, uh, you you uh, the the press the political press attempts to basically articulate what the the uh, the candidate's position is, and that candidates try at least. Uh, to articulate what their position is. Sometimes they'll be vague on purpose, right? I mean, there'll mm-hmm. be times where obviously they don't want to get pinned down. Uh, mm-hmm. But if they're vague, at least they're trying to uh, articulate that in some way, right? Uh, or they're consistently vague. Re- exactly. And yeah. and that that goes not just for them as a candidate, but for their surrogates, for their entire machine. And... Trump's machine does not work that way at all. Give give people an example of of that. Well, a simple example from recently uh, after the first debate, he said, uh, I thought Lester Holt did a great job. And the next day he said, I thought Lester Holt was terribly biased. And and it's that's a routine thing for Trump is to say completely different things in the space of 24 hours. And it's, it's not just that he contradicts himself. It's that. He doesn't care, and the campaign doesn't care, and there's no attempt to reconcile one with the other. Right. Now, ordinarily, a campaign is concerned when it has a mixed message because that confuses the voters, and it allows the press to pounce on the inconsistency. But again, the Trump campaign and Trump himself just doesn't care because if it's impossible to figure out what's going on, where he stands, what he's for, he thinks that's to his benefit. I don't know if he's thought it through as a conscious plan. doesn't really matter because right. that's his behavior. Right. I mean, I, ha- I happen to think that in terms of the, the Lester Holt uh, example, it was just that he, he lacked the sw- self-awareness to realize that he did not come off well during that debate. <laughs> and when uh, his advisors you know, told him, like, oh, this didn't go that well, he just came back with, um, you know, Lester Holt was one of the reasons why it didn't go well, and so Lester Holt was was uh, was a um, uh, was you know the equivalent of the of the of the broken microphone, I guess, or was sure. But what, one of the reasons why candidates for president try to be consistent, try to avoid blatant contradiction, is not just that it confuses the voters and allows for gotcha games with journalists. It's that. There's a subliminal message there about what kind of president you would be. We don't want a president that's blown around in the wind like that, who reacts to the last person who talked to him, who doesn't seem to actually have a grasp of the situation, and is just flailing about from rhetorical device to rhetorical device. That says something about what kind of president they would be that's very disturbing. And and again and again... With Trump, when you try to map his campaign behavior onto what kind of White House this would be, it's mind-boggling. Well, and and that to me, it seems like is is a um, uh, not only does he not care about that that consistency and that that uh, that it is almost a selling point for the Trump yeah. candidacy. Okay, um, right. That confusion is a plus. Well, I mean. 
not just the confu the, the 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 actual confusion that is sown, but that he doesn't play by the normal rules. Like he right. doesn't care, and that right. in and of itself, I think, is is also a, se- a a selling point. You know, the confusion it seems to me to be like on some level a um, uh, maybe not necessarily a conscious one, but it it functions tactically. Uh, yeah. But it also is a a feature of his disposition, I think, that is attractive to his voters. Yeah, what what I've been trying to point out in several things I've written during this campaign cycle, Sam, is that campaign journalism, the way it is traditionally done, rests on a whole series of assumptions and expectations of the candidate that were built into it a long time ago and mostly invisible because every candidate who made it this far obeyed them. And Trump comes along and completely smashes those expectations. And what happens is that the practices that were built on them collapse. But the press keeps doing them because it that's what it knows how to do. Uh, and I think this is one of the trickier things that's happened during the campaign. So if confusion is to his benefit, he doesn't care, and he just wants to make a normal policy discussion impossible so people vote on raw emotion and tribalism, then when you say, Mr. Trump, where do you stand? You're actually being enlisted in that chaotic plan. And and you become a foil uh, in mm-hmm. some respects for... Not just a foil, but, but, but a part of his... Uh, his his machinery. And so um all right so that is the uh that is sort of the I guess your first principle is that idea that um political journalism ha- has rested on this picture of politics you write that journalists and politicos share and that mm-hmm. is largely that like this is the way it's been done this is what a candidate tries to present and um journalists make it challenging for the politician to present within that frame framework in such a way that it is, um, you know, uh, completely dominated by the, the, the politician, the journalists are there to sort of tease it out and make sure that within that framework, um, they're, uh, they're disclosing, I guess it's full disclosure within that framework. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, the assumptions behind the, political journalism, American style, is that we have two major parties that are roughly similar in the way they operate. They have different philosophies. And every four years, they ballot out uh, to see who can gain temporary advantage. And then during the non-election seasons, they're skirmishing day to day day for even smaller tactical advantage. And the journalists overlooks this scene, comments on it, reports on it day to day, tries to strip away the veil, show us the inside maneuvering. Uh, And the system is stable in that sense, from cycle to cycle. And there is nothing in that picture and there's nothing in the rule book derived from that picture for what to do when a candidate comes along who's a McCarthy level threat or is a, a threat to the democratic system itself and the press itself is part of that. And I think the shock of that threat still hasn't really sunk in, even though the difference between Trump and a normal candidate has by now started to become incorporated into political coverage. And and before we even get to the candidate, uh, you talk about the fact that the press has not, and I would argue they still have it uh, to a large extent. And 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 I I have to say that this has been, I mean, I, there obviously I I have some concerns about the election itself. But um, a, a major disappointment for me was that I thought you know a year plus ago when uh, Trump uh, announced that he would do exceptionally well, far better than I think the the. Uh, the, the the journalistic uh, world assumed, and that mm. it would force um, the uh, the establishment media to recognize that there was something fundamentally that had changed about the Republican Party itself uh, right. and the voting base, and and right. and it seems like 
And I think, frankly, you know, uh, the Clinton campaign has not helped in this regard and in, in some regards uh, has 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 hindered the uh, ability of the press to come to this sort of realization. I don't know if they're even there yet where they realize, like, you know, this guy didn't drop out of space. You know, George Soros didn't invent him and send him down by a ray gun. He was elected by a a, a, a political party. And you talk about how. Um, the you know uh, both Mann and Orenstein had uh, had written a uh, a book about um, uh, how the Republican Party had gone off the rails. Uh, mm-hmm. You didn't mention Fubar, which I wrote in two thousand six with Stephen Sherrill, but it was probably okay, not the enough. probably yeah. not the literary accomplishment. Uh, but that dynamic, so the press ignored it for a long time. And I think uh, this audience is probably um, uh, uh, well versed in sort of uh, uh, of that dynamic. But then you uh, you talk about this uh, concept that you first uh, uh, developed um, uh, by, uh, you know, sort of extending the analogy that Josh Marshall had talked about in terms of technical debt, in terms of Mm -hmm. what he had been working on on his own blog as a as a site. uh, Mm -hmm. Tell us that. Well, there's a concept in um, IT and in programming called technical debt, which simply refers to the fact that when you improve uh, a software system and you change it so it can do new things, you often create small problems for yourself with other parts of the software system. And you may um, be able to ignore them initially, but eventually if you don't go back and redesign and rebuild the entire system, these small problems build up, and over time, they become big problems. And so, as Josh says in his post about this, it's not um, a simple decision. You, sometimes it makes sense to ignore the rebuild and just make a patch, and, but other times you have to go back and and actually rethink the whole system. And if you don't do that, uh, eventually what happens is the thing crashes. So he uses this metaphor of technical debt to explain what had gone on with the Republican Party over a long period of time, where, for example, it should have confronted the wing of the party that wants its representatives to do things that are just politically unachievable when you have a Democratic president, Uh, but it never got around to confronting its own base with the difference between wish and reality. Um, Another example he uses is um, there had been constant attempts to repeal Obamacare, but they never got around to putting forward their own program. And these debts or or flaws build up over time. And according to Josh, that's what opened the Republican Party up to be vulnerable to a huckster like Trump. Uh, And I think that kind of I call that asymmetry between the parties is something that the press didn't want to recognize because all of its routines for reporting on politics are built on a symmetrical image of of the parties as roughly similar but contending with different philosophies. So that's part of it. So what I did was take that metaphor of technical debt and say the same thing had happened in journalism is certain problems had built up that you could ignore for a month, a year, another year, but they were problems like um, he said, she said journalism or false equivalence, which has become such an issue in this campaign, or the fact that journalists were really a part of the political establishment rather than um, an outsiders or critics of it, and uh, horse race journalism and uh, insider as perspectives on politics. All these things that had been part of my criticism, but not just me, many other people, were true. They were valid, and they were problems, but they were easy to ignore. And that debt was sitting there just waiting sort of to explode when Trump came along. So, all right. So in the in the um, ex- the um in the case of the Republican Party, you know, an, an, another example of that debt would be, for instance, like the the, the, the birther movement itself. Uh, you sure. know, Absolutely. John Boehner was asked, I think it was back in 2011 uh, on I think it was NBC. You know, are you going to tell your 10 or 12 members of your caucus that, hey, you can't bring up a bill saying 
uh, that Barack Obama is not an American. I mean, mm -hmm. and he just said, no, it's not my job to do that. And that's a, right. a, a great example of he's allowing this to metastasize. Um, right. And, uh, the, you know, uh, the, I, I would even uh, I had uh, the, the, you could see this with the Red Sox uh, as, as someone who grew up in that area, you know, for for decades. They would, uh, you know, as long as the seats were filled, they never felt that they had to get to the World Series. Uh, and uh, they just kept that sort of ongoing, never, you know, the uh, always a bridesmaid type of situation. And, and that's that that dynamic is going on. So the press not only missed that, that that was going on in the Republican Party, but also you're you're saying the, the other part of that is that they had their own version of that that was going yeah. on uh, right. that was related to what was going on in the Republican Party only insofar as what was happening in the Republican Party was making it clear that their old set of tools and assumptions were not working and their system was getting creakier and creakier by day. Yeah. And yeah. they were just sort of punting exactly. on that infrastructure repair. Yeah, because when you ha have routines and assumptions and ways of working in political journalism that assume – a symmetrical world of two roughly similar parties that contend with different philosophies, and yet the parties are growing more and more dissimilar. And uh, as Norm Ornstein and Thomas Mann put it, and other political scientists have said, you have asymmetric polarization, where one side is becoming more polarized than the other or at a faster rate, but the routines of political reporting press towards this symmetrical model, what happens is that day to day, your portrait of the political world is getting less and less true, but it doesn't look that way because it, it looks like it always has. And that development had been going on for a long time, but Trump comes along and now all of a sudden it's a crisis. I mean, that's a pretty ossified um, – uh, I mean, the, in that sort of description, the press has become so ossified that it's basically like, we made the suit already. We're just waiting for you guys to show up and fill it. And yeah. um, they just keep ignoring the fact like, hey, one of these guys is just bulging out of, uh, of the pants and yeah. uh, their hands are hanging down below the cuffs. And, it, it, and so are we at the point where the, the press – uh, they they now seem to recognize like, boy, that suit just seems to not fit. Uh, are they at the point where they realize like, OK, um, do they even have a concept of w w how do we tailor this to what the scenario is? Or do you think that there's like just more punting and hoping that we, they won't have to, you know, come January, it'll all be normal again? I think there is a recognition that. Um, there's something different about Trump and that they've got to perhaps do something different themselves, but they're trying to do it within the tools and and routines they already have for the most part. Now, recently, we've seen this increased willingness to call lies lies. That's good. But that could have started a year ago. Right. Uh, it's not like the lying changed in any fundamental way. Um, and we have seen more of an investigative push, um, for example, on Trump's foundation, which has been really good work by the Washington Post and some other uh, signs of that. Um, but what we, what, we, what we never did see, and maybe this is unrealistic to expect, is for the people producing campaign coverage to sit down and say, this is, this is a very different challenge we have here. This is... This is something we didn't prepare for. This is this is something we have to we have to reinvent ourselves on the fly, or we're going to fail big time in this campaign. That moment never really came, and um, I think there's there's a lot of reasons for that. I went to a, a conference on campaign coverage in May of la in 2015 at the University of Chicago, put on by University of Harvard and, and University of Chicago. Lots of major players were there. Chuck Todd was there. Mark Halpern was there. The chairs of the major, uh, major parties were there along with the communications directors. And it was supposed to be uh, an attempt to um, show that people new to the beat how this is done. 
And I went as a critic just to absorb um, the press thing because that's what I write about at this event. And this striking thing to me as somebody who studies press coverage is that nobody even once asks this question, what are we trying to accomplish with our campaign coverage? Like, what, what's our goal? If we, if we had been able to ask them, they would have given us a tautological or circular answer, something like, well, we're here to cover the campaign. You know, like campaign coverage is designed to cover the campaign, to do good stories, to, uh, you know, to, to win prizes, whatever. And I think that, too, the purposelessness, the circularity of it, where the goal of campaign coverage is to cover the campaign, that had also been a weakness for a long time that was just waiting, lying there, waiting to be exploited. Do you think um, there is, I mean, so you, there is, and, and, and I, and I do, I, I certainly have the sense that the, the press has a, um, has turned some type of corner when it comes to, uh, to Trump, but it, it doesn't feel to me like there's any, um, recognition of like you know trump is the i don't want to say he's i don't know if it's quite accurate to say he's the tip of the iceberg uh but he is you know he's like the he's the projection of a of a real of a, of a political party in 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 many respects and it doesn't seem to be that level of awareness in the press for that like that seems to be the no. bridge too far right like you'd yeah. hear more people going and asking paul ryan like hey what do you make of this <laughs> except mm-hmm. paul ryan what I think you is- don't what you don't have stem is you don't have any connection being drawn between for example a phony fantasia case for war in iraq in 2003 and the fantasia of the Trump campaign in 2016. There isn't any through line there that the press is trying to draw from us, for us. Uh, And that's, I think, the result of of failing to see that the two parties were changing and and becoming less like one another and and that that asymmetric polarization or something, something very strange was going on in the base of the Republican Party, that was too hard to, to build into the picture of politics that the press gives us. A really good example of this is when CNN had to design its political coverage knowing that Trump was going to be the Republican nominee, the conservative commentators or um, what do they call them, contributors that they had were almost all of them anti-Trump. Right. And instead of drawing the logical conclusion from that, which is, man, our people are all against him. This guy must be way out there. They fixed it by paying Trumpazoids to become contributors. And by Trumpazoids, you could literally mean people on the Trump payroll. Yeah, Uh, right. (laughs) And 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 embarrass themselves by by hiring Corey Lewandowski, but he's not the only one, so you shouldn't treat right, him as right. a special case. Um, and there, what you see there is rather than draw a conclusion from their own people, they did what they had to do to restore a symmetrical balance to their presentation. Right, and that's that's what I'm trying to write about in my piece. And uh, I mean, because theoretically, I mean, it's it's hard for us to imagine this, but they could have kept those conser- conservative contributors on to yeah, comment on uh, on yeah. on Trump, and maybe then maybe also bring in, I guess, um, uh, Lewandowski or uh, uh, someone of that ilk. Theoretically, I guess. I mean, maybe well, maybe the, they the do that is, a little bit too. But they didn't try and. They didn't try that from yeah. the shock, right? They they thought they had a system that represented both sides and would work perfectly for the election, but something happened that disrupted that system. And rather than deal with that and face it and present it to viewers, they tried to fix it by buying Trumpazoids. 
Right. So, all right. So, uh, with with that said, um, what? Give me your sense of like what. Um, I mean, I, I guess it's too much to ask, right, that there's going to be some type of fundamental change in the next four or five weeks. I imagine people are a little bit too busy about um, and, and, you know, and I think I, I guess it remains to be seen. You know, I'm sure there'll be those conferences in, you know, starting in December and then in maybe in January and, uh, you know, through the spring. Like, what would we have done differently? What do we need to right. do in the future? And right. and then I would say by by midsummer, all of that will be forgotten and they'll just be covering uh, the obstruction of, I mean, from my perspective, uh, hopefully, God willing, uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, Supreme Court picks. But and they'll be covering that obstruction, I would imagine, in a very similar fashion, right? It'll probably go back to what it was with government shutdown type coverage, and yeah. So, all right. So, um, with, with is there any hope of any sort of broader reform? How would that happen, or is it, are we going to have to go through this uh, again? I, I don't know. Um, about the only advice I really have for them is. Try to portray the asymmetry using the tools of journalism you have, which can be done, and that's that's one thing they should be doing. Just how different you have the election is with one conventional candidate running according to the norms of American democracy, and one candidate who is trashing and is a threat to those norms. You could portray that um, better than they have been. The other thing I would advise is. You know how sometimes you, you see in an office building or something, you know, break this case in case of right. fire, you know, like they may be at that moment where they have to ask themselves, what do we do that we, we can, what can we do that we don't normally do? Like sometimes when you have a, a civic emergency, like the Detroit News or something, will put a, an editorial on the front page. They don't normally do that, but they do it if there's something really important. So maybe they're at that moment. I mean, that's um, like the Huffington Post, right? Putting that addendum yeah. on. I mean, but, and and when the Huffington Post did that, they got jeered at by the right. rest of the press. Um, I defended them. I was like the only one to defend them. Uh, I wrote a piece about them putting Trump in the entertainment section, and the reason I defended them was they, at least they're thinking for themselves. Right, they're you know? trying. They're recognizing <laughs> right. this is something different, and we're going to cover it differently than we would have otherwise. And I tried to applaud that. And they're communicating um, that to their to their readers at, at yeah. the very least. I mean, there may there may be a better way to do it or not, but they're at least communicating. We realize something is fundamentally different about this guy, and, and this is just so far with the best way that we have come up with to yes. to indicate that to you, but still be using you know the HTML and the letters that we use to express ourselves and. And everything right. else. So we could right. write everything, I guess, in like a red font or something. Yeah, uh, it was something like that. It was an attempt like that. The other thing that I think is, is, is possible here, and, I, and I, don't, I don't think we're at this point yet, but one thing that political journalists don't know that I try to tell them they don't listen to me, they don't believe me, <clears throat> excuse me, is that there is huge frustration with political journalists among other journalists who work in other beats and sections, whether they be science journalists or economic journalists or people who cover religion or whatever. There's a lot of frustration with the political press among their colleagues. And it may be that those people who are part of the press but don't report on politics, maybe they have to do something. Maybe they can't just sit uh, and silently by with their own frustrations, because I talk to them with them occasionally, and I know there's there's. Like what are the nature of those frustrations? There. Say again. What, what's the nature of those frustrations? Well, um, things like he said, she said, and right. false balance, right. and failure to be a real reality check, and failure to portray uh, a uh, an imbalanced feel right mm. um and uh insiderness and savviness and and th those kinds of things it's not, it's not like other journalists can't see that they can and the reason that i mention this is that it's very hard to talk to political journalists about their work because everybody but them is a partisan you know what i mean yes and therefore has a stake 
and therefore is probably making this criticism because they feel their candidate is losing or their side has been treated unfairly. And so it's another thing that political journalists do is they kind of disqualify everybody else from being a critic because everybody else – has their own politics, which is another name for democracy, Sam. You right. know, like we're supposed to have our own politics. So that maybe there's something there, but that would only kick in after the election. All right. So lastly, give me your assessment of uh, Lester Holt. Uh, that's he's obviously the only. Well, I mean, I guess we could go back to Matt Lauer, but I don't think that's. I don't. I mean, unless you have a unique perspective on uh, on uh, you know assessment of how he did. Um, the, largely his, he was panned. Um, but how do you think Lester Holt did in the first, you know, real debate, I guess? And um, uh, how do you think that's going to influence the other moderators going forward? Well, I thought he did okay. I was, I was particularly um, impressed that he took uh, a hint from the others that had written about it. He, I think it was uh, Glenn Kessler of the Washington Post mentioned this. He he kind of built his fact check into his question about right. the Iraq war um, rather than checking it afterwards, said as a premise of the question, you know, that you, you didn't oppose the war before it started. Right. Um, and I thought that was good because uh, that treated that claim the way it deserved to be treated. Like, we're not going to argue with you about this. This is the way it is. Right. Um, so I like that. Um, and I thought he was a little passive at other points, but I do have some sympathy with the reminder that people constantly give me when I talk about the moderators and fact checking that, you know, it's about the candidates. I agree with that. I think I think most people agree with that. Almost everybody agrees that it's not about the moderator. And so letting the candidates talk is good, letting them engage each other is good, letting it go on even if the rules are being trashed a little bit was good. So I would say he did okay, and then that, building that fact check into the question was, I think, very effective. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think also just the set of questions that he asked I thought was uh, particularly refreshing after Matt Lauer's uh, questions. And, and, the, and the sort of the, the, the universe of potential questions – that get more towards the uh, the individuals and sort of I mean the, the, as opposed to like the pundit questions they were really right. more like what would you do as president questions for the most part which I thought was yeah. uh, was pretty good Matt, uh, Matt Lauer was overwhelmed by the task and he he didn't seem able to think about the challenge of interviewing Trump yeah uh, kind of startling. Uh, it, it's going to be a tough. Uh, it's going to be tough to expunge that from his Wikipedia going yep. forward. Um, but uh, uh, Jay Rosen, thank you so much for your time today. Really interesting stuff, and um, uh, we will see how the rest of this goes. But folks can find your piece at PressThink dot org. Uh, Jay Rosen, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Good luck. It might take all the to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick But the 